have all that much to prepare. But what she wanted me to talk about was um, sort of single ventricle failure, but really end to end stage single ventricle failure. Given that we recently had a patient who was a Fontan who had a bad, um, and that was a little bit of a new experience for us, but I don't think it's going to be an isolated event at all. So it's something we might as well start talking about now and getting used to a little bit more. Um, <coughs> so as you guys know, here we have a lot of single ventricles. And they come in a lot of different flavors, but they all get palliated with the front hand. And palliated is kind of the key word because, you know, we don't, you know, unlike a lot of the congenital heart diseases we have, we cannot take a single ventricle and repair it such that the circulation Fontan is a is a not a normal circulation. It works for a period of time, uh, but just not having a pump attached to your pulmonary circulation is probably a temporary thing. And there's actually other cardiologists at other centers, but recently we talked to just say being a Fontan is just being in a state of compensated sort of engineered heart failure, and that's just the way it is. Um, so we know that Fontans can do poorly over time, but there's a bunch of different reasons why they can. And the approach to the failing Fontan really depends on exactly why they're failing. Um, and we've talked about this a little bit before in one of my other coffee with cardiology talks, so we won't spend a lot of time on it, but there's a bunch of different ways. So first, you could just have ventricular failure, in which case they're not gonna be all that much different than lots of the, the other kids we see with ventricular failure, like dilated cardiomyopathy. Their ventricle, um, <coughs> whether it's a left or a right ventricle, just because of the fact that it's not a normal sort of working heart where there's two ventricles pumping together, that ventricle being just an isolation on its own, over time, can you basically have just muscle failure where it doesn't work as well anymore. And it can get stretched out or it can just stop squeezing effectively. So for those patients, they really have a systolic heart failure where things stop working. Um, another way it can fail is the valve. The single agent valve can start leaking more. Um, this is particularly a problem with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, where tricuspid valves are much more prone to sort of late failure and leaking a lot more. And that's going to get you a state that's a lot like just having a primary muscle failure. And in fact, it can lead to worse than primary muscle failure. But if the squeeze, even if it's squeezing okay, is not effectively forcing blood to go the right way because its valve, its one way valve is not working and the tricuspid valve is leaking the other way, you're going to lose cardiac output. So it's just going to be another form of systolic heart failure. Right. Fontans can also form or fail for other reasons, besides just sort of the standard pump failure like we talked about. They can have diastolic heart failure. So what does that mean? <coughs> um, diastolic heart failure is when the heart can't fill up effectively. So it's not that the squeeze is impaired and the systolic you know, portion of getting blood out to the body is impaired. It's just that it's not effective in filling up with enough blood to be able to squeeze out. Um, so we see this in other kinds of cardiomyopathy and heart disease too. They have really high filling pressures. It's really hard to get them to. We actually see it all the time in the immediate post-op kids who need really high CVPs. But that usually goes away if you can if you can eat them through the immediate post-op period. But if that and diastolic pressure is really high all the time because the muscle's disease and it's stiff, then you're not going to eke anybody through. It's just going to be always having a problem filling up. So Fontans can do this for a couple of different reasons. They can have problems filling because the ventricle itself gets sick and it can't fill up. Um, or they can have a problem with the Fontan circulation itself. So Fontans can fail even if their heart is squeezing really effectively and doing just fine because blood cannot make its way through the pulmonary system. So you know, when your pulmonary vascular resistance, when the uh, resistance, kind of the stiffness of the blood vessels going out to the lungs and through the lungs gets to the point where it's not letting blood through effectively, Fontans can get into a lot of trouble because there's no pump to overcome that a little bit of raised resistance and then a little bit of, of uh, sort of forcing back the blood across. So those patients are going to act a lot like a patient who just has a restrictive diastolic problem with the heart muscle itself filling up because it's just not going to be able to, the blood's not going to be able to make it through the pulmonary bed and get back. So they're not going to fill up their ventricles effectively either. Not because there's a problem with the ventricle itself, but because there's just not enough blood getting through the lungs to be able to provide a good stroke every time that blood pumps. All right. 
right? So that's a, another way Fontaine's can fail. So, so far we've named a bunch of different ways. Um, and then there's the whole class of just sort of Fontaine complications, which I don't think we need to get into a lot right now, but PLE, classic bronchitis, um, and Fontaine liver disease are all things that are showing up and obviously causing us more and more problems as we need to control more and more of these patients because we are getting really good at getting them to Fontaine a lot better than we used to be. Um, so what this all means is we are an increasing number of single ventricle patients who are making it to Fontaine, but they no longer are able, I mean, eventually most of these patients are probably going to fail for one reason or another. We're learning more and more that even the, the single left ventricles that you think would be okay because it's a left ventricle that should be able to pump are just not going to be able to do it for a full lifetime. And these patients are going to end up getting into trouble. So what do we do for these patients? Well, we are trying to catch them earlier and earlier and starting them on heart failure medicines and things that we do for all other types of heart diseases to try and preserve whatever ventricular function we can. So when we're talking about the systolic failure patients, there are a number of different medicines that we use for congestive heart failure that we think can prevent the hearts from getting disease and from getting remodeled to the point where they get stretched out. So ACE inhibitors are really commonly used in Fontaine's with this problem. Um, beta blockers we use in other kinds of heart failure. Nobody's ever shown that they're effective for Fontaine's um, and single ventricle disease, but we use it anyways. Um, aldactone looks like it has a real promise in helping prevent pathologic remodeling. So we put them on all these medicines. And for some patients, that can really preserve function for a long time, but probably can't preserve it forever. Um, so we end up being on a lot of medicines and still having problems. Now what if they fail because there's problems with blood going through the lungs itself and it's not a problem with the muscles? Um, we try things like sildenafil, which is, uh, helps relax the pulmonary vascular bed and, and lower that resistance of blood going through it. For some patients, that seems to be effective. There are some centers who put all their fontanes on sildenafil automatically because they think it's going to be helpful. Um, we don't do that really yet. We have a low threshold to do it if we think a fontan is having trouble. So, we try medicines like that. Um, you can put them on oxygen. So that there's other pulmonary hypertension meds that we haven't really gotten into, but um, there are some places I think are using procentin, which is another pulmonary vasodilator to try and help that Fontaine's. But none of these things are super effective long term in preserving a Fontaine who just really has bad high pressures to try and force blood through the lungs. Um, so eventually we run out of medicines and we're stuck with a patient there's not much we can do for it. We end up uh, saying, well, they're sick. You know, they're not able to maintain a normal quality of life. So in the past, we have said, we should listen for transplant and try and see how we can do it. The problem is spontaneous don't do as well as other patients with transplants, so we're not really excited about doing it, even though we do quite a few here. Um, Fontans clearly have lower survival at transplant than, than other patients whereas most diseases are going to do well over 90% post-transplant one-year survival. Fontaine's are probably between 80 and 85%. So significant, um, significantly increased mortality at heart transplant. Uh, but we still want to try and get them there. The problem is, so why are they doing poorly? Well, there's, there's a number of different reasons that they go into it. The first one, and probably the easiest one to understand, is Fontaine's bleed. They've been, had surgery multiple times. They have a lot of scar tissue. So the surgery is complicated. When the surgeons go in to take out their old heart and put in a new heart, there's a ton of bleeding. Bleeding leads to longer bypass runs, or runs, longer ischemic times for the transplanted heart. And they don't do quite as well immediately postoperatively. When the patient stays intubated and bleeds a lot, there's a lot of pressure postoperatively, they're more prone to having big complications than they should be. Um, but there's probably other things wrong with Fontaine's that contribute to the mortality at transplant a lot more than other things. So Fontans have kidney disease, probably because they're always in sort of a quasi-low output state because they just can't increase the amount of blood they're pumping out. Um, they have liver disease that we've talked about because their livers get sick from this constant non-pulsatile back pressure of things going into them. They have bone disease, they're often debilitated, and then that's not even adding into things like PLE that can make them so there's lots of things that Fontaine's are bad at. But in the past, we would say, well, there's not much we can do, let's listen for transplant, we'll cross our fingers, and we hope we get through. Um, with new, the 
particular assist device technology that is kind of shifting now for the things we can do. Uh, oh, and the other thing I didn't talk about with Bob Pants, it's complicated for transplant, um, which was definitely an issue with the last patient we had, is uh, elevated PRA. So do you guys understand what a PRA is? We have you draw it all the time, but you probably have no idea what it is. Um, so uh, PRA stands for panel reactive antibodies, but essentially it's just a measurement looking at how many antibodies to antigens, which are little proteins on white blood cells, you make to all other different antigens that people can have. So PRA is basically just a percentage of the number of people who you are making antibodies to who could be your donor. Um, so if you have a really high PRA, we say, oh, the PRA is 90, that means 90% of the, individual, the individuals who could donate a heart to them they will be making antibodies to you before transplant. So when you transplant them, that makes them much more likely to reject. Uh, and we, so that's challenging for us because we don't want to immediately transplant someone who's going to reject. We have some therapies that are moderately effective in lowering PRAs, but they take time to work. We can't just wash them all out at one time. We have to really modulate the immune system and try and shut things down. So the, the antibodies they already have go away, and they're not making new cells against these antibodies. But that can build these new antibodies. Um, but in a Fontan who's not doing well, we don't have the luxury of having time to get rid of all those antibodies. So we're stuck with a patient who we have limited donor pool to, um, and who probably has other end organ disease besides just their heart that's sick. And that's where VADs have come in and are probably changing it. So uh, it used to be that there were really no good bands for a Fontan. There was nothing that would effectively sort of fit and work in that circulation. Um, we are gaining more experience, both at other centers and out here, with different bands that we can use to make these better. Um, <coughs> the first one, the one we used before, I think I'm the only Fontan we've done before recently, was yeah. the Berlin. So we've all, we've had experience with Berlin Hearts here. Um, it's pulsed out bad, extracorporeal, extracorporeal, it sits outside the body, they stay in the ICU forever. They get clots on the bad. It's a really high stroke incidence. We don't really like them, to be honest with you. And I think it's probably a technology that's going to go away completely in the near future uh, because it's just a hard thing to work with and it's not a great solution. But the good thing is it's being replaced by other things. So I found, I dug out my like promotional materials. We can pass around and look at things. Uh, but there's a couple different choices. And what sort of ventricular assist device you can use really plays in uh, to exactly what's causing the failure. So if we're talking about a patient who has mainly a systolic failure, we'll even say a diastolic failure, a ventricular failure, it's the heart muscle itself that's having problems then we can use the device that we actually just use, which is called a hardware. So it looks like that. And I'll pass this around. You can see it's a really small little thing. And this is where VADs have sort of really changed over time. And miniaturization of technology has made these possible to use. Um, but, <coughs> let me open it up and see if I can see it. So the hardware looks like this. This part, surgeons basically sew into the ventricle. So this is the part that's sitting inside the heart and sucks blood out of the ventricle. And then sitting on the inside of this one is this little rotor. And I wish I had one, but I don't, because it'd be cool to show you. But maybe next time we pull one in, I'll bring one, a, a demo device. There's a little magnetic rotating thing that sits. So there's no gears, there's no bearings, there's nothing. It spins on a magnet, so there's very little to form clock, which makes it cool. And this little disc basically just rotates and creates centripetal force. Then. Centripetal force that flings blood in and then it shoots it out through basically a big long tube that goes up to the aorta. So it cannulates like this, which you guys all see. Um, but it's very small. It fits nicely into adult patients in their chest. It's internal, so the only thing coming out is a drive line. Uh, for this particular bad, the amount of things they have to carry around are pretty minimal. Um, it's really simple to use for any of you guys who took care of our recent patient. There's not many things to change. You can
can change how fast it's spinning, and that's pretty much it. And how fast it's spinning is going to is going to change how much blood is circulating out. Um, and for adults who have regular bronchial circulation, this device actually has shown them a really pretty low complication rate and a pretty high durability for long-term support. Um, there have not been a ton of them done in single ventricles, but there are more and more being done. Um, I think we learned on our last patient that you can definitely do it. I think we um, also learned that those patients are probably going to be tenuous for a little while afterwards. You're going to really have to sort of balance their fluids and make sure you're still getting enough blood through the Fontan pathway to be able to fill the vat up and let it do its job. Um, but eventually, probably achieve that if you just take time and let things settle out. Um, but that sort of brings us to the next issue is you can have your bad replacing your ventricular function really well, but if you cannot get enough blood to go through the lungs in the Fontan to fill the bad up and let it do its job, then it's not going to be successful. Um, so what are we going to do for Fontan patients? That's the main problem. Not that there's a problem really with their muscle function, but there's a problem with their pulmonary resistance and getting blood to go through their lungs. Um, for years, people have been talking about putting little pumps actually into the pulmonary artery itself as a Fontan pathway. Nobody has ever gotten anything close to bringing it to market to use that I'm aware of, but people have been talking about it. So instead, we've started really eyeballing um, total artificial hearts, which is this one. So this is Syncardio. There's actually two versions of total artificial hearts. I've never seen the other one. That's Syncardio probably will be the only one we go with. So a total artificial heart is pretty cool. Um, let's see if there's a big picture. But essentially, you cut the heart out, and you stick in these two little pumps. And they're actually, uh, it always goes together, but they're actually two separate Works pumps and there's Velcro pieces in between them that you can sort of spin them around and forth to make them fit in the right way you want to. But there's just two pumps. So you basically cut one heart out, stitch this pump to one side of the atria, leave a little bit of atria, stitch the pump in, stitch the outflow onto the pulmonary artery, take the other one, stitch it to the left atrium, right? So it fits in well, stitch it outflow into the aorta, pumps that way. These are pulsatile, so it's sort of like the Berlin where it is. Like, there's an action where it's squeezing. It's not just a continuous flow like the others. So clot formation is probably a little bit more of a risk. It's more of a risk with pulsatile things than it is with um, continuous flow devices. It's there. So the beauty of this for Fontan, we haven't done this in Fontan yet. We did do it in other patients who have pulmonary vascular resistance problems recently, and he did well too, um, is you basically are just taking the Fontan out of the plate. You make them no longer a Fontan. Now there are two ventricle circulation who has a right ventricle. It's an artificial right ventricle, but it's a right ventricle that is pumping into their lungs. And whereas before that pulmonary vascular resistance, because there was no pump pumping through it, was too much for their circulation to handle, now it's not that bad. It's actually not that high because it's, it's only a little bit elevated, and now they have a ventricle that can pump through it and be just fine. So for those types of Fontan failures, where it really is the pulmonary vascular resistance that's affecting it, not so much the heart. So the artificial heart's really maybe the way for us to go. Um, these are not the easiest things to manage. Um, they have issues. They have issues with clot. Um, Michigan just made a big deal about it on the adult side because they sent somebody home with a total artificial heart. It's the first time they've ever done that. Um, but their sort of go-home driver, when they have one, is still pretty huge. But it's probably better than it came down. So it's a reasonable thing to use when you have to use it. Um, Syncardia right now, I'm going to talk about size of the other one. Um, Syncardia is coming out with a smaller version of this device that's probably going to be able to get down to kids who are five and six years old, potentially. It's really being made for small adults, but we're probably going to be able to wedge it in with children. Um, Ming is interested in having us be one of the centers that is testing that device when it actually comes out where they're sort of doing it 
um, trials. Uh, so we may get in on that, we may not, I don't know. <laughs> but either way, that technology will be coming um, and it'll be a part of, of sort of our armamentarium for how we can take care of these kids in the future. Um, so uh, when I was talking about size, so for the hardware device, um, the party line for the company is you can get it into anybody who has a one meter squared body service area. Um, that you usually will get us into about like sort of 10 to 12 year olds. Um, when I have talked and heard other people speak at conferences about using the device, there are people who are definitely pushing it down to kids with like 0.6 body service area. So that can get us down to sort of five and six year olds. Um, so we are still sort of stuck at school age and above for these devices and anything below it, we have Berlin and that's it. Um, but I think that technology is going to continue to advance and get smaller and smaller and smaller. So these devices might change, um, but it's going to be the same principles. And we're probably going to make it so that we can have more and more and more kids being supported for a little. Um, there was a trial that I don't know if anybody's talked about before um, that's at the moment sort of dead in the water. But it's called the pumpkin trial, which is was pumps for kids, infants, and children because it's a pediatric trial and we have to have a cute um, but uh, it was originally sort of a competitive trial where the NIH put out a lot of money to different sites to develop um, new pediatric specific ventricular assist devices. Um, several places submitted proposals, a couple got chosen, or four actually got chosen. Um, in the process of those, three of the four devices that were chosen dropped out and left one device only. Um, and that device actually just recently did not get cleared by the FDA for use in humans, so they're sort of back to the, the testing board, and we don't know how long that trial is going to be on hiatus. We are one of the core centers, if it ever comes back up, um, but I don't know if and when that will be. That device is called the Jarvik Infant 2000, but um, we actually, a bunch of us went to to Duke last year when they thought we were going to be close to being in trials and went to a wet lab and got to see these devices being put in in, in the pigs. Um, it is a teeny little thing, like a little about yay big. Um, so even though that may not be the device we go to, that's how big things in the future are going to be and that's going to open up to a bunch of our patients. And I think, I think um, using these sorts of, of uh, Using this sort of technology is going to become more and more prevalent, not really just in single ventricle patients, but in a lot of our patients. Um, we are definitely not the biggest VAD center for pediatrics by far compared to other places that are out there. Um, a lot of that is because our surgeons are really good and we don't have to use them as much as other places do. And I don't, I'm really not saying that like tooting our own horns. We really have great surgeons compared to a lot of other places. Um, and we don't end up with the problems with a lot of the other that the other a lot of the other places do. That being said, doesn't mean we should be slow to use these in the patients where we do need to use them. And I think we're gonna we're starting to be more and more open to putting these things in. In fact, there may be a couple of patients out there as we speak who we've been talking about these on. So we'll see um, how those play out. Have questions about anything? Would they put them on like ECMO first, or would they do it before their function so bad to where like before they crump? Would so they do it early? That's a really good. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, if you look at the adult literature on ventricular assist devices, if you wait until that long, your outcomes are going to be much, much worse. And in fact, adults now uh, won't usually bridge those patients. If they go that far, they're just not even going to use the device on them. They're not, that's, it's not going to be a good, out, good enough outcome for them to do it. Um, we don't know if the same principles apply to pediatric patients or not, um, especially smaller children. So right now, yeah, I think we would, if we had to go to ECMO, I think we would much, much rather get these patients before they get to the point of ECMO, thinking that it probably, even if it's not the exact same mortality risk that the adults see in their patients, um, thinking that we would still do better if we got these patients when they're in a little bit better state of health and put them in electively or semi-electively than sort of uh, um, 
space is really sick. Let's try this sort of a scenario. Um, so I think we're going to start thinking about them more proactively than we have in the past. Uh, let's see. There's a whole idea about temporary beds. We've done this a couple of times too, where we try and put somebody on just a centromag pump and take the oxygenator out of the circuit and see how we're doing it. Um, the candidates we've done that in so far have been pretty stinky sick when we did it, so maybe not the best. Um, but the idea about doing that is you can reduce the big ECMO circuit and all of its tubing and the oxygenator and all the things that are sort of clobberous and shrink it down to a really small set of tubes and just a circuit there. You probably reduce the promise risk and the stroke risk by doing that. Uh, I think we're, we're probably going to start thinking about those types of ideas, sort of the temporary, like we're going to be on a bed for a few weeks and then maybe we even get off of it okay. in the future. Um, but we will see. There's a, there's a lot of things that can change coming up as these technologies become more prevalent. I mean, it, it, we're clearly going to use them. Like we still need to figure out exactly how and in what patients we're going to use. Kurt, in the the patient that we did put the hardware in, did the pregnancy make her heart failure worse? Quickly? Yeah, we think we think so. She seemed to be doing okay before she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, so whether she actually had a real postpartum cardiomyopathy, mm -hmm. which can happen. Um, or whether you just have a big, much bigger circulating blood volume when you're pregnant, your blood volume, you, you get a little bit more anemic, but the actual amount of like, you know, liquid blood goes up significantly when you're pregnant, and that may have been just too overwhelming for her single ventricle to cause it to not get sick. So exactly what happened to her, I don't know, but she, it sounds, we didn't know her before, I know. Um, but it sounds like she was plugging along and doing okay until she was pregnant, and then after that she was really sick. Do you know what kind of care she was under before she came here? Was she under an adult congenital? She was under uh, pediatric cardiologist care. So she wasn't under an adult congenital. Do we know whether she was getting I, special OB care? Don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't think she was followed by, uh, by an adult congenital cardiologist yet, but I don't think that's actually too unusual. Right. A lot of our young Fontaine's, when she was pregnant, she was only 22 or 23. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of those patients would still be just with their, their regular cardiologist and not have transitioned over to Delta Dental even in our own program. Yeah, I know. But I think it's interesting because, you know, we may see more and more of that particular circumstance, too. Yes. As these girls get older and yes. they do get pregnant and then this is the result of it. Right. We really are just seeing this whole generation of Fontans coming to the age mm -hmm. where they're going to do that. So, um, yeah. A I mean, I think amongst the nurses it was pretty impressive to yeah. us how well that patient recovered and how quickly she went home. Um, did the f physicians feel the same way? Uh, I mean, we were happy about it, but it wasn't particularly unexpected. Um, you know, her, uh, she sort of behaved how I thought she would physiologically. I thought she was going to have a lot of problems with fluid shift mm -hmm. because she actually didn't have the greatest Fontan press. She, she was not the greatest Fontan from a blood through the lungs standpoint either. She had a bad ventricle and also had some problems with blood through the lungs. So it wasn't completely clear that just fixing the ventricle part of it and putting the bad in was going to make her perfect. But the thought was, if we put that in and really make her ventricle fill up better, give her a little bit of time, and blood will start moving through her lungs more effectively too. And the reason blood wasn't moving through her lungs effectively was mostly due to her ventricle. Um, and that's what happened. It's just she needed to uh, I mean, if you guys remember, she needed like a week or 10 days of basically lots of fluid, mm -hmm. a lot of boluses. Whenever, after she woke up finally, whenever she would wake up, she would need, when she'd stand up, she'd get hypotensive mm -hmm. and she'd need a bolus to try and get that blood through. But then that just sort of went away mm -hmm. as things got better and she cooled off from surgery and, mm -hmm. and her Fontan, her blood started flowing through her Fontan more effectively. So that's, you know, seems to what happened. It's... I was starting to get a little bit nervous about her when it was still, when we were like 10 days out and she still couldn't stand up without getting hypertensive, but she turned around kind of like we thought she would. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, she went home really easily. That's the cool thing about these devices, particularly the hardware, is you, you can, it's not hard to use, it's pretty easy to get a patient to do it, mm -hmm. and you can go home. That's really cool. So once they get the device, <clears throat> is she now a transplant candidate, or do you just live with this device until it 
doesn't work anymore? Um, so you can do What's both. Next? Right? So um, for adults, the idea of just destination bad therapy, the idea that you're never going to be a good enough heart transplant candidate for us to think that we should allocate an organ to you um, is out there. And there's lots of adults who will just live on these beds for years and years. And the, these, the newest devices that come from, particularly that one, seems like they can last for a long time. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. Um, our thought with her, she has a lot of antibodies, is that we are going to try and get some of those antibodies to go away over time, um, try and make her a better candidate for transplant, and hope that eventually she is a transplant candidate. So we are using this as a bridge to transplant. It's okay. just maybe a long bridge. So it's not necessarily a bridge for everybody that's going to have one of those to no. use it as their last. So it has not been, until very recently, the idea of using that as a destination the, the end of your therapy, destination therapy, um, in pediatrics was not really an option. That we thought that this was it was okay to have a kid just to get to a bad and then stop because that technology was not good enough to offer good enough quality of life. That idea is definitely changing um, as the bad technologies have gotten better. And people thought, well, even if they're not a good transplant candidate, if we can give them years of good cardiac output, and I mean, who knows how many years you actually have. Uh, then maybe this is a reasonable therapy to offer these people as an alternative to transplant. It very well may be that, that given enough time, bad technology advances to the point where it's so good that transplant essentially goes away and it all becomes ventriculars and devices. I don't think that's in the near future, but I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if within my career we don't transplant anymore, or at least not without rig with any regularity. And instead of where will she, how will she get treated to drop her PRA? Where will she, is it an IV? Yeah, so it's IV medications. Um, we have a couple of different things that we use. Um, we use uh, rituximab, mm -hmm. which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. So CD20 is a, is a protein that's expressed on, on uh, B cells as they're maturing. And so uh, it's essentially trying to eliminate all the newly developing B cells. B cells are the ones that make antibodies. Um, so you basically give these people every so often a dose of rituximab, stop their new B cells from forming, and wait for all their old antibodies to try and sort of go away. Mm -hmm. The problem is the cells that make antibodies in the mature form can hang around for a really long time. So the other medicine that we use and what we're probably going to use for her is a medicine called Fortezimib. Uh, our other Fontan, the one on the Berlin, actually got Fortezimib a couple of times and did drop his PRA um, to actually get a heart that he wouldn't have been offered otherwise. Mm -hmm. So um, Fortezimib is a is a um, anti-plasma cell drug. Plasma cells are the mature B cells that make antibodies. Um, it was actually um, designed as a drug for multiple myeloma, which is a plasma cell cancer. Um, but we can use it to just wipe out plasma cells. Otherwise, we try just eliminate all those existing plasma cells that are making these antibodies. And then wait for the antibodies that are just flooding the circulation to go out and nothing to do that can make portions of them. So these are things we can do. It just takes time to allow the drugs to work, to wipe all those antibodies, or wipe all those cells out so that they're not there when we try to transplant too far. And it's not a, nobody, these are not 100% effective therapies. Sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. In which case, we may be stuck in the, in the, while you're out of the app, that's what you're going to be, you know, destination. Yeah. Has there been thought as to where she would go to get this treatment? Would it, it be in, it would, she'll come back as an inpatient then for a day or so and get for it done? I mean, this is still sort of in the works, but, um, because she's a Fontan, mm -hmm. we, her feeling, and I think the adult's feeling too, is that we are more equipped to be able to deal with any of her needs um, and comfortable dealing with her heart failure needs, um, given her circulation as it exists right now. She, has, she still is a Fontan. And so she'd be a problem is she's 25, so we can't admit her to the floor mm -hmm. because the residents aren't allowed to take care of patients who are 25 and above. Um, so, yeah. we can 
Yeah, I just I knew. I know there's some outpatient infusion areas that are non-chemo infusion areas, but I was thinking she probably would not be there's appropriate for that. Usually, I think those places would be scared of her, and yeah. um, at least right now. And I think that uh, the, there's potentially enough fluid shifting and enough reaction to these medicines that it could cause a problem that she'd probably need at least a day or two of monitoring. I don't okay. think that means she's going to come in every so often for like a week. I think it'll be you know an overnight Always. stay or a two-day stay, and then we'll pick her back up. And how we're going to deal with these patients as they become more and more prevalent, I think it, it's a work in progress. For sure. Well, that was 35 minutes, Kurt. You were worried about hitting 20, so Thank there. You. Any other questions for Kurt? Are we done? Are they ever going to go to the adult? Like, so she got transplanted, we kick her over there right away. <laughs> um, but I don't think the adults have any interest in I don't. I, I think this is our this is our population. I mean, even if they're 35, like their physiology is our physiology that we are used to dealing with, and they over there are not. And spontaneous do require a different amount of a different approach to care and the way we deal with their fluid shifts, the way we tolerate the fact that she got hypotensive every time she got up. It's what we see with that spontaneous. So uh, probably that patient is going to be better served in our unit. No. I mean, they took they took the one kid over there to they put the. They took him because he's a total artificial total heart. Artificial so heart. once you put yeah. the total artificial heart in, maybe it's a different. Maybe they'll take care of all those because, like I said, that changes it. From, mm -hmm. You go from being a fountain to not being a fountain. Yeah. Um, and I don't have a problem with that if they if they have the most experience with that type of device and the patient is old enough that they feel comfortable with it. Still a fun camp, they're probably best being us. All right. Well, thank you, Doctor.